For the next five minutes, you'll see scenes from this 50-minute video for the McGregor 19. The full-length film includes lots of launching, rigging, sailing, powering, and water skiing. We'll then take you step-by-step step through the construction of a McGregor 19 and show you why we think that this boat offers the best value to be found anywhere. Unlike any other sailboat, this one will go 25 miles an hour with a 40 horsepower outboard. You can store it in a standard garage. This is important because many communities won't permit outside or driveway boat storage. It can be towed legally anywhere because it's less than eight feet wide. The 800 pounds of water ballast gives self-riding stability. It can be dumped out to give a 1,250 pound boat that can be towed behind most small cars. Without the water ballast, it goes fast enough to pull a skier. The water here is choppy, but it's pulling our man quite nicely. Not too many sailboats can do this. Accommodations are better than you'll find in any boat of this size, power or sail. Here's the sink, the enclosed head, and a six foot three by five foot ten rear berth. Without the enclosed head, any trip longer than two hours can become really grim. The ice chest and a place for the stove are under the front double bunk, and there's storage under all seats and berths. This is your narrator, me, Roger McGregor, and my grandson, Lauren, taking a break. The cruising spinnaker gives really great downwind speed. It's colorful and fun to fly. In heavy winds, the boat will plane under sail and reach speeds of around 18 miles an hour. Few other sailboats can do this. This is the masthead Genoa, and our heroes are sailing in rather tight quarters. It takes about 100 pounds at the top of the mast to hold it down like this. When they let it go, it really wants to be upright and gets there fast. I weigh about 180 pounds you can see that the water ballast makes for an incredibly stable boat. We're quite serious about building lots of these. This represents a few days production. There's a swimming and boarding ladder. And a fold down cabin cover and spray shield. Cabin headroom here is six foot two inch. A back panel zips in to completely enclose the cabin. The neat table can be clamped in any position or removed completely. With the mast stowed below, it's a small cabin cruiser. And if the engine quits, and they do occasionally quit, you can still sail home. Here's a perfect little yacht that can be anything you want it to be. And the fun is endless. Let's go off to the launch ramp. Look how easy all this looks. If it's easy, you use the boat a lot. If it's hard, you won't. 
One of the big reasons launching and trailering is so easy that the boat is light, really light. Anything over 2,300 pounds or so will require a big car or a truck, high-cost trailer brakes, and a lot of work. With a heavy boat, you'll see a lot of scenes like this. Or this. Or this. The Complete 19, with its trailer, weighs only 1,630 pounds. This is the water ballast valve at the rear of the boat. The water ballast system is the key to the 19's light weight. The 800 pounds of water ballast provides the self-riding stability of a keel, but can be drained out for powering and trailering. When you launch the boat, the valve is opened and the water tank fills by itself. When you retrieve the boat on its trailer, the valve is opened and the tank drains. When under power at over 8 miles an hour with the valve open, the tank will drain itself, lightening the boat and allowing much higher top speeds. Launching and trailering is easy because the boat sits low on its trailer, lower than any other sailboat and most power boats. You can't do this with most sailboats. They would have been stuck in the mud quite a ways out from shore. Here are some extreme examples of high boats and their problems. This is a J-24, which is billed as a trailerable sailboat. The deep draft problem can be solved partially with a really long tongue. The problem is that most ramps have ends, and when the trailer wheels drop off the end, you'll need cosmic assistance to get out. Ramps are built for normal trailers. This guy's brakes and rear suspension are history. This poor soul must have cranked for hours. He's getting tired. Many boats, like this Catalina and the water ballasted hunters, have their keels or centerboards partially exposed, which cause the boat to hang up on its trailer, as we see here. These exposed keels and centerboards are also subject to damage when beaching. The 19 measures only 25 inches. Each additional inch means that you go 10 inches more down the ramp to launch the boat. This is a Balboa 26. 50 inches. This is 122. 43 and a half inches. This is a McGregor 26. 29 and a half inches. These are Catalina 22s. 36 and a half inches. This is a Catalina Capri 22. About 50 inches. This is 125. 56 inches. These are Catalina 25s with their retracting keels. 47 inches. Notice how the boat stays aligned on the trailer because of the vertical goal posts at the rear of the trailer. Most traders don't have these. This is the result of not having alignment guides. If you listen very carefully, you can hear the dishes breaking.
You can always use a stick to keep it aligned. This poor soul has centering posts, but alas, they're too short. The point of all this is that good design can fix all these problems. If everything is right, handling the boat at a launch ramp is easy. Most builders rarely give this stuff much thought. They worry about the boat, but not how it's used. He fussed with this rig for nearly an hour before he got it out of the water. See the little ears on the bow stand? This makes a big target. Without the ears, it's pretty easy to slide right past and maybe punch out the back of your van or damage the boat. Without the ears, that little rubber block is really hard to hit. With the 19, you simply drive on, leave the engine running on idle so the boat doesn't back out. Go forward and tie off the nose. Notice the ladder that keeps our hero near the boat and out of the water. Without the trailer ladder, which gives you somewhere to stand, securing the boat can be fun for the spectators. Even a 40 horsepower engine is fairly easy to raise and lower. Notice that the engine and rudders clear the ground as the boat comes up the ramp. If the designer had given this rig another inch or so, this skipper's life would have been improved immensely. Getting it all workable and idiot proof is really a big thing. The rudders pin in the up and down position to make sure they stay in their proper place for trailering and sailing. Launch ramps are amazing places. It's worth the price of admission just to go and watch the fun. Nowhere can you see such an abundance of design miscalculations. Now what? How about creative solutions to really big problems? The executive chair alone must weigh over 200 pounds. There will be suspense. Will he catch his boat or have to go to a foreign country to find it? You'll see the latest in fashions and new ways to keep your pet around for a while.
and the best in human cooperation. Lightweight alone, without the other good engineering stuff, will not keep you out of difficulties. There will be really cool people. And those that are expecting the worst in their voyage. And pleasant company. When you're using the boat as a powerboat, the mast is really out of the way. If you sail a lot, it can be carried up here, completely assembled, which saves a bit of work at launching time. This is the mast joint that makes inside storage possible. Using the mast raising system, mast raising is really easy. Notice the short cables that keep the mast from falling sideways as it goes up and down. These can stay in place when you're sailing. Launching and rigging the boat takes less than 10 minutes. Even without the winch, it's easy work. Notice that the rig has a backstay, a wire running from the top of the mast to the rear of the boat. Several of our competitors omit the backstay and rely on a bit of faith to keep the rig in the boat while running downwind in heavy weather. It's a bit more complex, but essential. For trailering, the only mass support wire that has to be disconnected is this one, the forestay. All others can remain connected for trailering. Or you can forget about the mast raising system and just put it up there. It does require a little bit more oomph. The four-stay turnbuckle provides the final tensioning of the rig. We don't use turnbuckles on the side support wires because they're dangerous. These wires occasionally get tangled up on the trader fenders or deck hardware. When the mast is cranked up, the load from the wrong direction can bend the turnbuckle bodies. Several bends and restrainings will cause failure. The adjusters that we use are stronger and safer. We are here. And the good sailing is over there, on the other side of this bridge. A common problem. And here is the solution. Storing the boat like this has a big advantage. Loading and unloading groceries and goodies while at home is a lot easier than hauling it from a car to a dock. The whole package is less than eight feet wide and quite low, so it'll fit in the garage a lot better. 
Many states require permits for any trailer package over eight feet wide and restrict the hours that you can travel with a trailer. Do you really need another trip to the Department of Motor Vehicles for a permit? You can also keep the boat at one of the low-cost, mast-up storage yards that are near most launch ramps. This is a typical one. The low ones are mostly McGregor's. We've filled over 36,000 boats and filled up a lot of these yards. If you keep your boat at home, you can avoid this occasional problem. Here's the culprit. It's good not to have your boat looking like Mount Fuji. The cockpit is big and comfortable. The seats are over six feet long and make great berths on nice nights. The cabin is low enough the crew can see over the top. A lot of competitors have real problems with forward visibility. The cockpit is self-failing. This means that the floor is above the water line and any water that comes aboard runs right back out. No need to bail. The cockpit hatches will hold two standard fuel tanks. The tanks are completely outside the boat, so possible leaks and the resulting fumes will create less risk of fire explosion. The lockers can hold all kinds of gear and equipment. The weather-tight cabin provides lots of headroom and sleeping and cruising accommodations for four. Most power boats of this size have only a few cockpit seats and, at most, a V-berth with a head under a bunk. You have to get into the $26,000 category in power boats to get accommodations approaching what you see here. This is the front berth with seats on either side. Maintenance is easy. Lift out the cushions and squirt the whole thing out with a hose. No delicate varnished wood and no easily damaged upholstery. And no glued down fabrics that'll end up mildewed almost immediately. Here's a small cabin light to keep you from groping around in the dark. The rear berth is a full six foot three by five foot ten, nearly a full queen size bed. You won't find this in boats three times the size. The boat will comfortably sleep four. This is the head, the enclosed head. Imagine trying to use a portable head under a berth with a few people on the boat. It's essential to have four walls and a good solid door. And this is the view out the front window. This is a place for storage for a stove. The small lip just below the top will hold a panel with a recessed two burner alcohol stove or a small portable can be set on top. The other side serves as an ice chest. The sink is up and to the right. You usually don't cook or sleep at the same time, so the berth is a good place to hide the galley. There's a storage compartment under every seat and berth. The boat will hold an amazing amount of stuff. The optional boarding and swim ladder is really useful, both in the water and on the trailer. And now for sailing. The main sail goes up like this. The main sail is loose footed, so it doesn't have to be fed into the top of the boom. This is the boom fang, which keeps the boom from rising up as the sail fills. It's not essential, but makes for a much better sail shape and a lot more speed. This is the Genoa going up. This is the boat sailing with the mainsail and Genoa in a fresh 12 knot breeze. It's booming along quite well. The rig is quite pretty, very efficient, and very strong. This is the lighthouse at Angels Gate, the main entrance of Los Angeles' big and busy harbor.
Our crew of two now zooms along through Newport Beach's crowded pleasure boat harbor. Here we are sailing on a perfect summer day in the Pacific Ocean off Southern California. Not many things are better than this. The beautiful California coast is in the background. These are pelicans. As a result of DDT usage, which is now controlled, these birds were virtually extinct several decades ago. The DDT in rivers and oceans softened their eggshells to the point of disaster for them. Now they blot out the sun. Our crew is now sailing with a standard working chip. It's small and great for heavy winds and learning to sail. As you can see, it drives the boat along quite well with very little effort on the part of the crew. Here we're tacking out the narrow harbor entrance at Newport Beach. Notice the boat's stability and smooth ride. The crew does not have to hang out over the edge to keep the boat level. All controls are within easy reach. Here the boat tacks into the wind onto a new course. It spins around quite fast with little crew effort. This is one of the easiest boats to learn to sail. You can learn to get from here to there reasonably well in a single afternoon. The ocean is filled with good things. Our crew is sailing past a pack of fat, lazy seals. The boat sails along well with just the mainsail. Not particularly fast, but well. Try this with some other sailboats. Our skipper is sailing backwards into the boat's berth with just the mainsail under perfect control. This is the colorful cruising spinnaker. It flies just like a Genoa, but is a lot bigger. It's quite easy to control. Sailing across the wind or downwind, it adds a lot of speed. It has the advantage of a true spinnaker, but without the complex rigging and spinnaker pull. Jibing with a cruising chute is a snap compared to a conventional spinnaker. and the crew must be rewarded for good work.
This is an experimental rig that we have just started to explore. It's a gigantic cruising spinnaker set at the end of a telescoping pole that retracts into the hull. It's surprisingly easy to use and makes the boat fly. Here it's scooting along at a really good clip in a very light breeze. In heavy winds, the cruising spinnaker will take the boat up to 18 miles an hour, faster than most conventional sailboats. The reason for the extreme speed is the 19's planing powerboat type of hull. With enough wind, the boat will skim across the top of the water, just like a powerboat. This is impossible with the curved hulls of conventional sailboats, which seldom sail over six or seven miles an hour. In these pictures, the water tank is empty. Expecting heavier winds, we brought along a trapeze to keep the boat flat. Today, however, no trapeze was needed. Now we have a very fast cabin cruiser. There have been attempts to make boats that were both good sailboats and good power boats, but they were too heavy, too slow in either configuration, and were total failures. This one works, it works well, as is obvious from these pictures. It'll hit 25 miles an hour with a crew of one. Each added 100 pounds will take one mile an hour from the top speed. With one person aboard and the water tank full, it will go about 17 miles an hour. All this with a 40 horsepower motor. The boat performs well even with the mast up. No one will expect a sailboat to flash by like this. With this speed, you can really cover some distance and get to places that you could never reach with a conventional sailboat. Here are a few dolphin waiting for us to pass by. Here's another view of the California coast. You seldom see a wake like this from a sailboat. Going fast is not always the best. Here, in a leisurely return from a cruise, we're powering up Newport Harbor, one of the nicest sailing areas in the world. Try this with any other sailboat. It's not the fastest ski boat in the world, and you'll never pull a crowd, but you can have a lot of fun. Considering how lumpy the ocean is, our star is doing quite well. You'll have better luck tempting the kids to come along if you can offer them this kind of incentive. Dunsky requires a bit more power, but it will still work. We drilled a hole in the bottom of the boat and let it fill. This was the result. It will not sail well like this, but it beats swimming. Notice that the boat's still fairly stable as the crew moves around. Even when totally flooded with the water tank full, it tries to right itself. With the water tank full, we pulled the boat over on its side. It takes about 100 pounds at the top of the mast to hold it down like this. When the mast is released, the boat really wants to return to an upright position. This is with the water tank empty. It's about as stable as most power boats of this size. Here it is with the tank full. It is really stable. Engines can quit. This is one solution. This is another solution. Notice the wind. With the 19, you can always sail home. The nation's waterways and oceans are absolutely full of interesting stuff. This one keeps the enemies at bay. The big ship behind us brings you your Honda. This is Catalina Island, about 26 miles off the California coast. A beautiful sunrise and a quiet anchorage can be even better than the trip. With your own private island, you can enjoy all the beauty and seclusion that you want. 
Most of the world's truly beautiful places are at the edge of water. Suppose you're lucky enough to own a McGregor 65. You can always take a 19 along as a shoreboat, lifeboat, or plaything. And here's a fact, kids love sailboats. Put on the music, fill the ice chest, bring out the coffee pot, and you'll find no better place for a couple or a family to spend an hour, a weekend, or an entire vacation. Let's move on to show you how these boats are built. We start with a highly polished and waxed three-ton mold. The boat is built from the outside in, starting with a white pigmented polyester resin gel coat. This is the exterior paint job, and the surface will be as good as the surface of the mold. This gun sprays both catalyst and gel coat. The catalyst causes the gel coat to harden and cure. If you look carefully, you can see the tiny spray of catalyst being blown into the spray of gel coat. While the gel coat is wet, the masking is removed, leaving a window for the black color stripe. The entire area is sprayed with black so that any air will be visible to the workers when the layup process begins. After the surface cures, a layer of fiberglass mat is laid into the mold and saturated with resin with a gun similar to the one used for gel coat. Rollers are used to remove any air bubbles from the mat laminate, and the resin is allowed to cure. Mat is applied to the entire area of the hull, including the centerboard trunk. Following hardening of the first layer, a second layer of mat is applied. While the mat is wet, a layer of fiberglass woven roving is laid in place. The roving is wet out and all air is removed. Unlike most competitors, we use no chopper guns which spray resin and short strands of fiberglass. They make a relatively weak, resin-rich part of somewhat unpredictable thickness. What you see here is hand layup, the strongest and most easily controlled method of construction. Additional layers of mat and roving are applied and cured to give the hull the proper carefully controlled thickness. Thickness will vary depending on the loads at each location. At high load areas, the finished laminate will be approximately 5 8 of an inch thick. This is the fiberglass water tank built on its own mold, being positioned and covered with fiberglass. This is the hull liner mold which makes the part that forms the interior of the boat. It's sprayed with gel coat and the first layer of mat is laid in place and saturated with resin. After curing hard, the liner's lifted off its mold. Notice the perfectly finished surface. The hull liner's trimmed, and then lowered into the hull and bonded in place, forming the complete hull assembly. The hull is then removed from its mold. Notice the molded in black shear stripe and the perfect exterior finish. The deck also is hand laid fiberglass and built in the same manner as the hull. This is the deck mold. Notice the non-skid deck surface formed into the mold. The window areas are masked off and the deck is sprayed with white gel coat. 
The masking paper is removed to make an opening for the black window stripes. After curing, the white will be sprayed over with black. The first layer of mat is laid down on the deck and wet out with resin. This is the finished first layup. Another layer of mat goes down on all flat areas and a layer of end grain balsa core is pressed into the wet mat. After the balsa bond cures, another layer of mat is laid in place, which completely encapsulates the balsa core. There are cutouts in the balsa where hardware will be located. Many layers of mat and roving are added wherever hardware is bolted or where there are high concentrations of stress. The deck liner, which weighs about 40 pounds, is bonded in place. This liner is laid up on its own mold just like the hull. It adds rigidity to the deck and hides the rough interior surface of the deck layup. Following cure, the deck is removed from the mold. This is woven fiberglass roving. The strands of glass, stronger than steel, run the full length of the fabric. The material accounts for most of the strength of the fiberglass parts. This is fiberglass cloth, also made up of long filaments of fiberglass. It gives great strength for its weight. And this is fiberglass mat, made up of two inch long strands of fiberglass filament held in place with light binder resin. It holds a lot of resin and provides stiffness and rigidity. This is a large template router that allows one man to do the work that used to require four. It makes a perfect cut that exactly matches what the finger at the top feels on the overhead pattern board. It will cut two inches of plywood or plexiglass in one pass. This is a mast for the 19 in its drill jig. For every hole it's drilled in any part or anywhere on the boat, there's a foolproof fixture that locates the drill and allows for a perfect hole. There's no need to use a measuring tape, a process that is fraught with error on any part of these boats. This fiberglass and steel drilling fixture lowers down over the deck to locate all holes and cutouts. It's hard to go wrong when you build the boat with equipment like this that allows no mistakes. When the drilled and trimmed fiberglass parts come into the assembly shop, a complete kit of parts is delivered to the assembly station. And the parts are installed in pre-drilled holes. Most assembly work is done on the hull and deck before they're joined. This is the hull with the head bulkhead in place, waiting for the deck. and the deck is lowered onto the hull. The deck is fastened with one quarter inch stainless steel bolts and lock nuts. Most competitors use sheet metal screws or pop rivets which don't offer anywhere near the strength and leak resistance that we have here. The chain plates bolt directly to the hull. This is the strongest system available. This shows the centerboard being raised and lowered. Note that it retracts completely into the hull. The boat's being picked up by its chain plates and lowered directly onto its trailer. After going through a rigorous inspection, the boat is rolled out. At peak production, a boat comes out every two hours. We make our own trailers. Here you see the side rails load into a heavy, strong, and very accurate assembly fixture. The rear cross member is loaded and secured. The jig controls dimensional tolerance to within 1 16th of an inch. After all the pieces are loaded and clamped, all welds are made. And the side rails are formed into place with hydraulic rams. The fixture rolls so that all welds can be made on the level, so molten metal cannot run out of the weld areas. The trader comes out of its fixture and is rolled to a cleaning area in preparation for painting. 
A heavy coat of rust inhibiting primer is applied. This is an electrostatic spray system. The paint with a positive charge is drawn to the negatively charged trailer. The result is a complete coat with very little overspray. The final coat goes on next. These are finished trailers ready to get their boats. We put two boats in one of these containers and ship them by rail to our dealers everywhere on the North American continent. They arrive clean and damage free. The cost is very low. If you live anywhere else in the world, a ship like this will carry your boat. To make things easier, your boat will arrive with a 22-page owner's instruction that covers everything. It's written in plain English and not in the arcane language of sailing, wherein a rope is called a sheet. In addition to the 19, we built the McGregor 26, one of the best-selling boats in the history of sailing. It's almost as easy to ramp launch and rig as the 19. It's extremely fast and very comfortable. Here we have a 26 punching its way into a rather nasty California winter storm with winds over 30 knots. Most sailing is done in relatively calm winds, but an unusual event like this gives us a chance to really ring out the boats. The California surfers will be wild when this monster comes ashore. The McGregor 65 Corporation builds this magnificent yacht. It's the fastest production sailboat ever built, and dozens of them are sailing the oceans of the world. This is a typical scene. The McGregor's high speed under power sail makes other boats look like they're tied to a rock. With all that behind us, we'll repeat a few scenes that might tempt you to try one of the most pleasant activities that the world has to offer. There's a line from the classic Wind in the Willows. There is nothing, my friend, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. Sailing off in a strong, comfortable, and cozy little yacht will probably do more to brighten your life than most anything that you can imagine. There are few things in the world that are as quiet, graceful, romantic, and just downright fun. The cost is low, the trailers you're mooring, and the wind is free. <laughs>